All right, everyone, we'd like to welcome you all here. We still have plenty of folks making their way in, making their way hopefully past the crawfish, not getting stuck up on that yet. Okay, we'll finish, we'll get that after the service. Let's all stand up. We have a great service ahead of us. We're excited about what's going to happen here today. We're going to start off fun song. this song and if we could get the words to the chorus up there the reason I love one of the things I love about this song is some of my favorite passages of scripture and pastors going to be speaking on him on these in the next few weeks is the is the words out of Luke 15 talking about the parables of the lost sheep the lost coin and the lost son and the words of here really speak to that never forgotten never forsaken never abandoned, not for a second. I am safe in your hands. 
always and forever. And I love the meaning of this, of this song. So as we sing this, really allow these words to kind of get into your heart, get into your mind, and really just appreciate how great it is to know if some of us have maybe a lost family member or a friend that we pray for, they are never, God's never is going to leave them, leave them alone and he's going to tr- bring, bring them back. Let's worship God forever with this song. Good morning. You can have a seat for a second. Welcome to church. 
Welcome to Grand Oaks Church on Facebook and YouTube. Good morning to you and good morning to those on campus today. Don't you just love the smell in the air? The crawfish smell in the air, right? So that's exactly what my car smells like, by the way. So don't ever leave the spices in your car overnight, okay? That's always a challenge. So, but so thankful that you guys are here today. Um, I asked the, the first service this morning, it's like, what are you praying for? You know, right now, after we do our first two songs, we always have a word of prayer. And uh, I love leading that prayer. But I thought, as I look across this morning, it's like, what, what literally are you praying for? Uh, every night, my wife and I, before, we've done this for a number of years, and we've memorized all these verses. Every single night, we pray at least 12, some of those we do multiple times, verses uh, over my son. We take God's word, right, his words, and we repeat them back to him. And we claim those promises, and we ask God to get involved uh, in my son's relationships, in his, son, in his jobs, in his decision-making. And, uh, and can I tell you, there's been many times, either during those prayers or, you know, outside of those prayers, that literally I ask God, God, I need you to show up and do something right now. I need you to, I need you to make something happen. And you know... God is waiting for us to reach out to him. That's what prayer is. Whether it's standing up on your knees, whether it's with somebody or by yourself, it's literally reaching out to God and say, God, I need you to get involved in this situation. I cannot, definitely not, do not do it, can't do it myself. I need you. And hopefully you don't get at a point where it's like desperation to reach out for God, you know? He's involved in the small things and the big things, but he's literally waiting for you to reach out to him. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Through these next two songs, through this pastor's message, through God's word, we're going to reach out. And we're going to ask him to show up, get involved, challenge us. We want God to move, and God wants us to move. Are you guys ready to do that this morning? Let's stand up. God's already here. And so when I pray this morning, maybe there's something on your heart that you walked in here with today. When we bow our heads and I start praying, why don't you pray to God? God, I need a miracle. I need this. I need something to happen. Or frankly, I just want to praise you, God, for that answer for prayer. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for loving us so much. I'm so thankful that you still move. Lord, I'm so thankful that you are so big. Nothing is big enough for you, Lord, that you know every single detail in my life. For those watching this morning, for those in this room, for those on the platform, you know everything going on in our lives. And still, you want us to reach out to you to ask you to knock. I know you're speaking, Lord. I pray that we are hearing. And this morning, I'm just asking you to do a mighty, mighty work in this service today. To be with our pastor, the message you laid on his heart. For those that are wounded, for those that have lost hope, they don't have any peace, they have nowhere to turn, or there's just a complete state of confusion, Lord, I pray this morning we reach out to you. We love you, Lord. We're so thankful that you sent your son, that we can have a relationship with you, that we can call you our Heavenly Father. We love you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I know you're hurting, I can see it in your eyes, so pull back the curtain, take off your disguise, never told you you ain't worth the fight. Cross tells a story that a 
can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Great job uh, this morning. Man, it's good to see you guys here today. Uh, we're having a great day in God's house. We're going to have a great day after the service with our uh, crawfish bowl. And I've got a shocking confession to make to you today. All right, you ready for this? I have lived all of these decades of life, and I have never eaten a boiled crawfish, ever. Isn't that shocking? Never. Now, I like crawfish. I like them fried. But, but this is my issue. I don't like to wrestle my food. Right? I just, it's just too much work. After a while, it's like, I'm not going to get enough calories from this to make it worth my while because it's just a lot of work. Right? Like, if I go out to get chicken to eat at dinner, I don't want to pluck the chicken. I just want it on my plate. All right? So, if anybody wants to peel me a bunch of crawfish today, feel free. All right? So, uh, but anyway, I'm glad that you're here. We're going to have a great time together, and we're looking forward to a, a good time today in God's house. I started last week a new series of messages called The Heart of God. It's, it's centered around Luke chapter 15, some of the greatest parables that Jesus told, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. Uh, the prodigal son is probably one of the greatest stories ever told, and it, it's, we're going to get to that next month. But, you know, when I began to study this passage out, I, I found out that chapter 14 and 15, although there's a break that was added by translators later to make the Bible more easily you know, passages found, but that break wasn't part of, of uh, you know, the inspired part of the Bible, and so the, um, the break really hides the fact that chapter 14 and 15 are the same discourse by Jesus, and what I found in the study was, and I'm going to mention it again because I think it's very startling, so chapter 15 looks at this amazing heart of God, his love for people and what that means, and it's so, such an amazing passage, but in chapter 14, God's calling us to a higher level of commitment in our lives. And that, to, that truth is just the same as chapter 15. In other words, God is calling us to commitment because he loves us. It's part of the heart of God. So we're going to talk about that today, working through a couple of challenging portions of Scripture. And today we're going to talk about counting the cost. What is the cost? Have you ever seen that? The cost of things can be interesting, can it? If you wanted to go see the final round of the Masters today, earlier in the week, you could have gone for about $3,500 today. It's about $5,000 this morning. If you wanted to buy a last-minute ticket, it's going to be a good uh, final round. And so, you know, and by the way, I, I'm just throwing this out there. If any of you want to buy me a present, Masters tickets, it will fit every time, and I'll never return it, all right? So that would be, just be a good thing. Uh, master's tickets would be nice to add to the list. So you go master's about 5000 today. Uh, in October, Taylor Swift is in Miami at Globe Life Stadium, and this is inexplicable to me how a Taylor Swift ticket could be worth more than the Masters. But, hey, it's ever, anybody's world, right? So 6000 if you want to go see Taylor Swift in Miami and sit on the third row uh, in the fall. Or I think the, this is the bargain of the deal. If you want to be mid-level, close seats, the open, opening ceremony of the uh, Paris Olympics in July, only $22,000. And, and it comes with a hotel room. So how can you beat that deal, right? So anyway, there, you know, sometimes the cost of things it, it, is startling to us. But today, Jesus is going to talk about the cost of being his disciples, the cost of being a follower of Christ. We're going to pick up Luke 14, 27. We studied verse 27 last week. I'm going to do it one more time to, to introduce. And Jesus said, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. I just, to highlight this truth for you again, Jesus had this huge crowd of people following him. They came for the miracles. They came for the, the food as he fed the 5,000. They came for the frenzy of the excitement of the people that were joining him. And yet at this point, Jesus looks at the crowd and he begins to call them out a little bit. And last week we talked about the fact that Jesus doesn't call us to be part of the crowd. He calls us to be part of the committed. And so Jesus drops this truth bomb in the middle of the crowd. He says, if you're not willing to carry your own cross, that doesn't have full impact to us today. But in Jesus' day, they all knew what that meant. These people were going to their executions when they were carrying their cross. And so Jesus is saying, listen, you got to be willing to, to, to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. And, and these are incredibly challenging portions of Scripture. And church, can I tell you, 
And this would be easier to skip these parts of the Bible. And even as a pastor, sometimes, you know, you're looking at this thinking, you know, those parables in chapter 15 are, are sure good stories that we all love so much. But this 14 is a little tough. So why don't we just chapter 15, we'll just study that one because we all love those sweet stories like the prodigal son. But church, can I tell you that you miss and the church as a whole, and I think Christianity as a whole today is in danger of, of, of avoiding the tough truths because we don't like them. And yet we're missing what God is calling us to in our lives. These verses aren't easy, and yet they're the heart of God for us. This is what God desires for us in our lives because he loves us. So Jesus begins to call the crowd to a higher level of commitment. And then in verse number 28, immediately he warns them, hey, listen, but don't begin. Don't begin until you count the cost. The verse goes on to say, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? This is, a, is one of Jesus' parables. It's, it's almost more like an illustration. By definition, that's what all parables are. And it's kind of short and to the point. And in this discourse, he uses two separate uh, kinds of parables to, to make his point. But, but basically, Jesus is saying, listen, you have to determine what is the cost of being a committed follower of Christ. The word there that's interesting in that phrase is the word calculating. In the, in the, the original Greek of the New Testament, that word literally means pebbles and you'd read that and say that doesn't make any sense calculate the pebbles that that makes no sense at all well this is an illustration of that truth so this is an an ancient abacus anybody familiar they still teach abacus in schools what that was that's a historical it's a historical everybody's looking at me like what in the world are you talking about um an abacus is a, a historical way uh, in ancient days of calculating financial and monetary and mathematical components they didn't have sophisticated mathematical uh, devices so and literally jesus is saying hey listen get out your ipads all right and that's the newest and the latest right you don't have to plug it in that's great too right no batteries to replace but jesus is saying listen get your pebbles out get your ipad out and determine hey listen if you're going to follow me are you willing to pay the price all right do you have what it takes to finish the job again back to that text it says um and I think that the heart of it is that last phrase. He said, for who would begin a construction of a building without calculating to see if there's enough money to finish it? And I think that's the point. And I think that's the point Jesus is calling us as Christians. He's saying, listen, are you willing to pay the price to be a committed follower of me for the long haul? Right? Not just for, for a, a season or for a, a month or for this phase of life, but are you willing to pay the price? To be truly committed to me over the course of your life. And I suspect, no biblical evidence, but I suspect maybe that when they were out there in the crowd, maybe there was a half-finished building somewhere close by, you know, that Jesus was kind of looking at. And the people were looking, or maybe in the town they lived, maybe even more likely, in the town they lived, maybe there was some kind of tower that they were building for the defense of the city, and someone had run out of money. They hadn't calculated it well. And so maybe this was an illustration that everybody got in their mind. And Jesus said, listen, you got to calculate the cost to see if you can finish it. I have a picture here on the, on, on the screen. This is the, um, uh, in, this is the State Hotel in North Korea, right? Began construction in 1985, and they've been constructing on and off for 25, 30 years on this project. Uh, never finished, never occupied. It's, uh, in today's dollars, maybe a billion dollars has been spent on this project. And you know what? Jesus' point is, if you look at, it, you look at that and you think, hey, that probably is just about right for North Korea, right? And I know if, if you're any North Koreans here, I'm sorry if I offended you, all right? So, uh, but but this, is, you know, this is just about right. And so, and, and this is kind of the same illustration Jesus is using, asking, listen, are you willing to pay the price to get it finished? And this is the point, obviously, he's not talking about construction projects, but he makes this point very clear. Look at this quote from John Stott. It's a little long. This is so good. I'm gonna, it's on two screens, but he said, the Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict half-built towers. The ruins of those who began to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warning and undertake to follow him without first pausing to reflect on the cost of doing so. 
Look at this next paragraph. It says, the result is the great scandal of Christendom so today, so-called nominal Christianity. They have allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. Their religion is a great soft cushion that cannot stand up to the test of life. And church, can I tell you, in great part, this is where 21st century Christianity has fallen. And this is the reason, and churches are afraid to teach the truth of this chapter because they say, well, we're going to offend people and we're going to push them away and, and, you know, we'll take whatever we can get from people. We'll be satisfied with that. But church, can I tell you, that is absolutely, not only is it not biblical, it is not scriptural, and it's not good for people either. Because God never asks you for a little bit of sacrifice. God never asks you for a little bit of commitment. And, and the reality is, as you talk about talking about these hard verses, as I was thinking this week, these are challenging verses. And how do you say it without it being offensive? How do you say it with still trying to draw people in? But, but, but I think this is true today. I think people today, you know, we grew up in Christian culture, those of you that are older, grew up in a Christian culture to where it was kind of the accepted thing to go to church. And so, you know, if you, if you chose to be a nominal Christian, it's okay, because, so, you know, everybody's doing this thing called going to church, right? But now we're living in a different age, in a post-Christian America, where now you're not expected to go to church if you don't want to, right? And I think now at this point, it's time for the church to stand up and say, listen, this is what Christ is calling us to, a committed relationship. Because I think people today, if people are seeking spiritual value and strength in their life, I think people are seeking for one thing. They are seeking for an authentic experience. And that's what we want to offer as a church. We want to tell people, listen, it's, it, you know, we, we want you to come. We want everybody to come. And if you're not sure about your level of commitment, please keep coming and listening. But can I tell you, we're not going to dumb down the message because people are afraid of commitment. Because th this is really what people want and need in their lives. They need to know, listen, a committed life to Christ is the only life that makes sense. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go. Verse 29, as he continues the story, now he has another illustration. Not, he started with a construction project. Now he's going to a military campaign. He says, otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone will laugh at you. That's the point of this construction project. They would say that's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. And that's what we're trying to avoid in life. Look at this quote by J.C. Ryle. He said, again, a really strong quote. It, it costs something to be a true Christian. Let that never be forgotten. To be a mere nominal Christian and to go to church is cheap and easy work. But to hear Christ's voice and to follow Christ and believe in Christ and confess Christ requires much self-denial. It will cost us our sins, our self-righteousness, our ease, and our worldliness. In other words, listen, there's a price to be paid for fully committing yourselves to Christ but church, can I tell you, and I'm going to continue to highlight these thoughts, but the price is worth it because this is the only life that really matters. We're going to look at that again. The second illustration, he begins in verse number 31. He says, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 can, can, can defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? It's a really simple story. There's some sovereign in leadership of an area, and he... He sees that there's this force of soldiers that are double his army. A powerful enemy is coming against him, and he's going to sit down with his counselors. He's going to sit down with his war cabinet. He's going to sit down with the leaders of his nation and say, listen, can we defeat them? And if we can't, verse 32, we will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. And at first glance, those two parables seem pretty similar. But uh, look at this quote from, uh, from one of the commentators. He said this, In the parable of the tower, Jesus said, Sit down and see if you can afford to follow me. In the parable of the king, Jesus says, Sit down and see if you can afford to not follow me. Because I tell you, the, the cost of following Jesus is incredibly high. The cost of not following Jesus is exponentially higher. The cost of not following Jesus. You'll never experience abundant spiritual life. 
You will never know God, his love, and his care for you. You will never have eternal peace and purpose and meaning in your life. You will never know or have the assurance of eternal life or the hope of heaven. The cost of not following Jesus, you'll never be free from any of the uncertainties that this life brings. You will never be free from the dread and the fear of death. And you will never be free from a sense of judgment and the unknown of what lies ahead. Folks, listen. All of the biggest questions in life, the biggest questions in life, are wrapped up in our faith and our relationship with God. And if you are not willing to pay the price to be committed to Christ, then you will never experience all of the best things that God has for you in your life. And then he sums up this very challenging passage by saying, all right, verse 33, so you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Ouch. Anybody here really like that a whole lot? No, we, we don't like that. It, it's a little tough, but, but, but let me explain it, and I, I think you'll understand. The word so there, obviously, is it, it, this is the conclusion of this whole discourse about commitment. It's the, it's the conclusion of, of, of what it means to count the cost, both for and against being a follower of Christ. And, and the word give up is an interesting word because the, the, the word give up literally means to reallocate. Right? So it's a little different than our traditional English understanding of giving up. So the idea is, listen, are you willing to reallocate everything you own for the cause of Christ? I'm going to explain that. Gary Enrick says discipleship involves a daily act of signing away ownership. Explain it this way. I'm going to uh, read to you a quote from uh, John MacArthur who said this. He said, Jesus, uh, let me see, back up one here. I've missed that MacArthur one. All right. Jesus is not advocating socialism or getting rid of everything and living a life of poverty. His point is that those who would be followers and disciples must recognize that they are stewards of everything and owners of nothing. And that's what Jesus is saying. When Jesus said you have to give up everything you own, Jesus is saying, listen, you have to be willing to put everything into my hands. You have to be willing to understand that life is about more than things. Life is about more than power. Life is about more than a job. Life is about more than ex, you know, experiences. But if you will put these things in my hand, then I will bless you. And, and, and many times, if not most of the time, God returns those things to us so that we can enjoy them within the framework of our faith in God, realizing that God is preeminent and first place in our lives. That's what that verse means. And it, it, it's still challenging, isn't it? All right? It's still so challenging. And yet Jesus is saying, listen, give those things to me so that I can give them back and you can enjoy them in the context of your faith. That means everything. All right? Let's back up one, one uh, slide there. All right? Mike Andrews said this. Jesus does not ask for much. Only all that you have. Your possessions, your time, your talent, your career, your desires, your ideas, your plans. He might not take them from you, but he does demand that you surrender title to them. He does not ask that you give them away, but rather that you give them up. Obviously, the demands of discipleship are great and the cost is significant. And folks, this is the point he's, he's making here. Jesus is saying, listen, once you understand the priorities of life, once you understand what it means to put me first, once you understand what it means to give up all of these peripheral things that the world holds so tightly onto, if you can learn to give these things up, then you will understand what it means to be a true disciple of mine. If you can put these in my hand, then you will not only understand the purpose of your life, but you will enjoy the blessings of God more because you put them in the right perspective. Because if you only live for life, for power, for money, for activity, for, if you only live for those things, ultimately those things will never satisfy you. And I know some of you say, well, Pastor, I'd like to try once just to see if they will satisfy me in life. But folks, all you have to do is read the stories and look at the lives of the rich and famous of our world, right? How many have self-destructed in their lives? How many have been lived miserable, horrible existences because these were the things they were living for and absolutely none of it brought them happiness or satisfaction or meaning in life? And what Jesus is telling us as Christians, he's saying, listen, give those things up to me. Put them in my hands. Commit your heart to me first. And then the blessings I give you, you will be able to enjoy them 
in the framework and the t- context of what it means to be a genuine follower of Christ. A couple of chapters later, Jesus told a story very similar. From here on in, in, in the gospel accounts, it's a call to commitment. It, it's, a, it's a story of the coming cross of Christ, and he's preparing his followers for those inevitable moments. And so, again, he tells a story here in Luke chapter 18. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question. Now, a couple of things we know about this religious leader. If, if you take all of the gospel accounts together, he was young. He was rich, probably powerful. He, he, he was from a prominent family. He, he had some notoriety in the community. He was a religious leader. And the fact that he came to Jesus was somewhat shocking because the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had this constant conflict with Jesus. And so he broke through that, all right, and came to Jesus, and he asked Jesus this question. And he began by saying, good teacher. And, and that word good is a word that is never used in the New Testament ever to just describe a human being. So it was a word that had a tinge of, of a, a de- deity attached to it. So literally, this young man is saying, listen, are you really the son of God? Are, are you really God in the flesh? Are you really who you claim to be, Jesus? And this religious leader asked Jesus this question. He said, good teacher. What should I do to inherit eternal life? He asked the question of all questions. The question that I believe every single person from the agnostic, you know, to the person that lives in the jungle somewhere, I think everybody has at some point in their life considered this question. What happens after this life is over? What should I do to inherit eternal life? And you know, at first glance, that looks like a good question, doesn't it? But that question is incredibly flawed. It is an incredibly flawed question for, for this reason. He said, what should I, back, keep, back up one please, what should I do? Right? This was the idea. What can I do to earn God's favor? What can I do to be good enough for God? What can I do to earn my way to heaven? That's what this powerful, young, rich, young man was saying. And those two terms, do and inherit, don't go together. Right? Think about it. What do you do if you inherit something? What do you have to do to get it? Nothing. Right? I talked to a friend a couple weeks ago in Austin. We were watching our grandson, my, my grandson and his son play baseball. And, and his, this guy's a, a, a growing in his faith. And he, he's, you know, we, so lots of have good conversations with him. But he was, he, was, um, he was talking about his life. He's a career musician and, and uh, uh, talking about how hard it was to keep a band out on the road and to, you know, to make enough money to support your family. And he was just talking all about that. But he said, yeah, but I got this ace in the hole. He said, man, I've worked hard doing this for like 20 years as a professional musician. But he said, my family has money, so one day I'm going to get money and not have to work for it. And he was happy about that thought. And you know what? We all like that kind of thought, don't we? Everybody would like a little money that we didn't have to work for. Everybody would like to have an inheritance one day. But when this young man said, what should I do to inherit? It, it was a question that, that didn't make any sense to Jesus. Because he knew this young man wasn't looking to God, to to Jesus as God's son, but he was looking to his own self-effort and ability to to merit salvation. And so Jesus gave him a tough answer in verse number 20. He said, but to answer your question, this is Jesus speaking, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You find it interesting in this response. Jesus only gave a few of the commandments. We don't know why. He doesn't explain why. And, and, but I think this is what I see. He started off with, with the ones that the young man probably hadn't committed, right? He probably hadn't committed adultery, pretty sure he hadn't murdered anybody, and at least in his own eyes, he had never stolen anything overtly, probably, all right? But then Jesus kept going. He said, you must not testify falsely. In other words, you, must be, you gotta be absolutely 100% truthful all the time, and you have to honor your father and mother all the time, every day of your life and existence. And so Jesus begins to bring these questions down to a more challenging point. Right? And the young man's response, I have obeyed all these things since I was young. Not only is he rich and powerful, he's also arrogant and conceited. Because he looked into the eyes of Jesus and said, oh, I'm 100% good on all those commandments. And I think in, in reality, he was saying, and just give me that whole list of 10. I've got them all down, right? Kept them all in my life. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, his answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Again, that's a verse that makes us uncomfortable. But 
Church, can I tell you that this is the only time Jesus ever said that? Only time ever. And I want you to be, I want to be very clear about this teaching today. The pathway to heaven is not th through philanthropy. Jesus over and over again told people the pathway to heaven is through faith in Christ and what he did. But the reason Jesus said this to this young man was because he knew his heart. Right? Jesus was God in the flesh. He knew this young man's heart, and he knew his heart, and he knew from the answers he had given that he was greedily holding on to things in his life. And Jesus said, listen, you got to let those things go and follow me. It reminds me of a parable that that they used to tell in Africa about a monkey. You know, monkeys pretty rambunctious, hard to catch. And uh, I actually saw one time, Karen, I saw a monkey open a car door, actually a chimpanzee. Is there a difference between a monkey and a chimpanzee? Probably is, but about the same, right? So anyway, this monkey actually opened, pushed the button and opened this door. And I watched it happen or I wouldn't have believed it. The best thing about it was my brother-in-law was inside and he scared my brother-in-law to death, which was a, a lot of fun that day. So I really enjoyed that part of it. But, but it's hard to catch a monkey. But they, this African parable says that the way they used to do it was they would take a coconut and put a small hole just big enough to get the monkey's hand in and they put food inside the hole. And the monkey would stick their hand down in the coconut and grab hold of the thing. And then when they came to capture it, it would not let go of the thing to pull its hand out. Can I tell you, church, that's an exactly an illustration of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, if you are holding on so tightly to the things of this world, whatever they might be, then you're never going to experience the power and the presence of God in your life. you got to be willing to let go of your things in order that you might hold on to Christ. And it's not that those things are bad. In fact, oftentimes in our lives, those things are a product and a blessing of God in our lives. But those cannot be the things that we are living for because they will always leave us wanting more. They will always leave us empty in life. And look at what the young man's response was. I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible. But when the young man heard this, became very sad for he was very rich. Back to our text in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this, so you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. If Jesus offers what he says he offers, church, please hear me today. These are tough passages, but please hear my heart today, and please hear the truth from the scripture. If Jesus offers what he says he offers, if he offers salvation, if he offers forgiveness, he offers a home in heaven, if he offers his presence in our life, if he offers an eternity with him, if Jesus offers what he says he offers, all right, if he does that, then there can be no greater possession than following him, ever. Jesus is not a minimalist when it comes to commitment. Can I say it again? Jesus is not a minimalist when it comes to commitment. It is not how little we can give that is the question, but how much God deserves from us. I'm going to close with a little quote from, uh, from a, a pastor, 20th century, late, late 20th century pastor Adrian, Adrian Rogers said this, talking about Christianity in general today, talking about this lack of commitment. He said, they have joined a local church but they have never truly joined Jesus. They have religion, but they lack relationship. They have a head knowledge about who Jesus was historically without a heart change. And this is a problem, a real problem. And that problem is that people attend church, they listen to churches, they, join serm they listen to sermons, they join churches, but they have never been radically, dramatically, eternally changed by the power of Christ in their life. Too many people have met God, have never met God, right? They, they, they just have religion, but they have never met God. They have been vaccinated with a mild form of Christianity, but they've never caught the real disease. And church, can I tell you, that's my prayer for myself, right? Authentic, real, genuine, committed faith. And that's my prayer for you. And that's my prayer for this church. And so we're not going to hold back from calling people to commitment because that's what Jesus did. And this is the only life that matters. This is the only life that makes sense. 
and we're going to and we understand this is a work in progress for all of us none of us are there right at the moment where we want to be but my prayer for you is that you in your heart will say listen i want to not just be plain church but i want to be committed to christ in my life can i pray for you now let's pray together dear god i come before you today god asking just for first of all myself because you know there are times when i fall short of these lofty standards of full commitment to you God, I pray for myself today. God, I pray for people in this congregation today, Lord, all across the congregation this morning. I pray that they would, would, would have a desire in their heart to be committed to you. Not because, God, you need this, but because you love us. And you know a life of commitment is the greatest life we can ever live. God, I pray that for our congregation. I pray that for us as a church that we would understand the heart of God is for us to be fully committed disciples of yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, if you want to talk to somebody about that today, a little bit more about what it means to be a, a committed disciple, Pastor Jamie's back in our uh, Connection Center, which is this door back here. And we got a lot of good things going on today, so Pastor Kirk's going to share those with us, all right? All right, hey, I got a couple of announcements, right? So uh, when you came in this morning, maybe when you walked through the doors to the immediate left there, um, our church is heavily involved in what we call a Go Community. And so we have chosen uh, to support a ministry called Communities and Schools, uh, which is actually in the Conroe Independent School District. And so in one of the high schools, there are a group of students who are absolutely uh, at risk of even graduating high school. And so uh, we're participating in that program. In fact, we're going to do something every single quarter throughout the year um, to invest in that program specifically. And so um, I'm not sure uh, where you're at. My, uh, we have, my Liz and I have one son. Uh, he graduated uh, several years ago. And so when he's going off to college, of course, Liz and I, uh, it's like, hey, let's go. We need to go to Walmart. We need to buy a microwave for your dorm room. We need to buy all your toiletries, comforters, all your sheets. Um, you go to the container store, you set everything up. So great. it was a great time, and then we get to help him move in. And so for these students within that program, there are 33 students graduating uh, from high school. Uh, again, this ministry has been a big, big part of that. And so within that, what, we, uh, what we're doing is that we bought 33 of these containers, right? So these tubs. And then we were given a list, girls and guys, on what to fill them up with uh, to provide to these students as a graduation, hey, help them move into their college life, into their college uh, dorms. Uh, you know what the biggest challenge of coming to second service is? Is we bought 33 of these, and they're all gone already, okay? So that is an answer to prayer, but it's like, hey, what can you do? And so... Um, they gave me a list, and so there's other things that we could do. So if you have used tennis shoes, uh, various men and women's sizes, again, they'll put that into the ministry as well. And then uh, they said they need a few slightly used men's pants, not a lot of sizes. So again, you can pick up one of those, but that's how um, you can uh, participate. Uh, so that is our Go Community. Uh, and again, I want to make sure I thank uh, Jim and Laura McGregor for heading up that ministry and for you participating. A second thing is this, so um, under the leadership of uh, Candy Stewart as well as Nicole Hauser, they lead our Go Kids ministry here at Grand Oaks, also uh, helping organize and taking for junior camp this summer. So for junior camp, um, my goal is, is for all of you to be safer drivers in this room. Okay, and how do I accomplish that? So we've got some, a Grand Oaks Church sticker and a leaf sticker with our cross in it. You can put these on the back of your window of your car and your bumper sticker, and I guarantee you, you will be better drivers. So the next time somebody cuts you off, you just go, praise the Lord. Okay. It is why I drive so careful around this area because I always think they probably go to Grand Oaks Church. Okay, so. But uh, you can buy one of these. They cost $10 a piece. Yes, that is more than a typical sticker would cost. But again, all the proceeds from selling this goes towards our uh, camp ministry, our junior camp ministry. So uh, pick up one of those. You absolutely can help. Maybe you don't want to put it on the back of your car, uh, but you can put it someplace else, right? So thank you for doing that.
Uh, also, on April the 28th, uh, we have, uh, again, part of our church ministry here is over in Africa, in Nairobi, Kenya, and Arusha, Tanzania. And so we have a group of you going to Africa this year. And so uh, we always look for ways that we can actually help them offset the cost. And so on April the 28th, uh, we're going to take up what we call a love offering. This does not come out of our budget uh, that we have for the church. This is actually above and beyond that. So this is a love offering designated. Whatever we receive in will divide amongst all the individuals going on that trip to help offset their cost. Also, uh, what they'll be doing is, again, when you walked in to your right, if you were to walk in, uh, we're going to have folks going on that uh, missions trip uh, are going to be doing different things to raise money to, to help them pay for the cost of going. Uh, so I think like Nicole Hauser, she owns her own business. She cleans uh, commercial as well as residential. So she's uh, doing a raffle tickets out there. I think for her, again, whoever wins that, uh, her company will do a deep cleaning uh, of your office or of your home. So again, that's something else uh, that you can help participate in. Um, I apologize. You guys missed the business meeting today. I know. You're devastated. Okay. So... Uh, between services today, we actually had a business meeting. So under our leadership of um, uh, Jamie Barron over here, who's our treasurer, and he is there's a whole finance team. Uh, they keep track of our, uh, they formulate and help formulate and track our overall budget and their spending throughout the year. So again, if you want that information, absolutely, uh, you can send myself, the office, or Jamie an email. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. In fact, we post all that information uh, out in the lobby because it's all uh, readily available. And in fact, we are very uh, excited to share with you that information on, on the money that you uh, give and, uh, and how it's received and actually how it's allocated and how it's spent. So, um, so if you ever need that information, let us know. On May the 4th, uh, yesterday the ladies did a fantastic uh, trip downtown, great ministry. Uh, Listen to a lot of ladies at Second Baptist downtown. So the men, we're going to do a men's breakfast here on May the 4th. And so that's coming up later this month. Uh, the youth, we're definitely going to have the youth tonight at 5 o'clock. So that goes from 5 to 7. Um, I don't think the masters will be over by then. But uh, again, we want all the teenagers to be here tonight for that. That's 5th all the way through the 12th grade. And then last, we have our crawl fest. Okay, so again, it is basically all you can peel and eat. Okay, so you get as much as you possibly want. Uh, I definitely want to thank, there's a lot of guys that have been, uh, we've been working on this for weeks. So I uh, definitely want to thank um, uh, Brian and Melinda Davis, David Lindley, Scott Duhon and his son Corey, Jason uh, Stewart, Eric Swiler, uh, Kevin and Sheila Island, my wife, uh, G. Cisneros. So again, all those folks are helping us uh, put all this on. Also, we've got about 96 exact hot dogs out there. In case you're not a big crawfish uh, appreciation, Pastor will be today. All right, so, but uh, we have some hot dogs out there for you, uh, waters as well. We have tables and chairs set up over here under the canopy. Some sit over here near the crawfish. In fact, over by the crawfish, if you're a really good crawfish eater, literally you can stand, peel your crawfish, and throw them right into the trash can. All right, so uh, actually I throw the shells into the trash can after you eat the crawfish. So that's over there as well. We have the inflatables all set up. My wife sent me a message during the service. She said, hey, the Titanic slide that's out there is really, really, really tall. She goes, that is probably not for small, small kids. Okay, so if you've got kids out there, make sure you tell them yes, yes, no on the Titanic, all right, unless they're a certain size, all right. So, um, but otherwise, hey, thank you guys for being here today. It's a blessing again, Jamie. Uh, Shalos over here, if you have any questions, stand up, you are dismissed. <laughs>